This is the PR Podcast, a show about how public relations helps you tell your story to the world. We talk with great PR practitioners who have the skills, creativity, and just plain savvy to get their clients noticed. Now here's your host, Jody Fisher. Hey everyone and welcome to the PR Podcast. I'm Jody Fisher. Thanks for joining us. Well, don't forget to send us your PR Podcast plug. Um, this is the cheap and easy way, cheap, it's free, um, easy way to promote something that you are doing. I joke around that I'm great at promoting my clients, but I'm horrible at promoting myself. Here's an opportunity to promote you and what you do. Um, now, it's not your nine to five. It's not that great hit you got for that client, even though we love that. Um, we want to hear about your podcast. We want to hear about your social media channel. We want to hear about your TikTok, your, the book you just uh, wrote, or the award you just won. Give us something we can love on you for. Uh, send us a note to the PR podcast. Hit us up on social media at the PR podcast, or just send me an email directly, jody at jodyfisherpr.com, and we will give you a mention at the top of an upcoming episode. Now on with our show for today. We've got a hot guest. Paul Wilkie is CEO of Upright Position based in Coachella Valley, California, where he and his firm represent B2B tech, IPO, and travel and tourism clients. Paul also leads Walking Duck, a video production company that's designed to efficiently create owned content that seamlessly converts into earned media, social media gold, and paid content. Now before PR, Paul was a reporter with the Delaware Business Review, which gave him a unique perspective on how all three points of the communications triangle operate and helps him tell compelling stories, garnering on media, uh, on message media coverage and providing sound strategic counsel. Paul, welcome to the PR podcast. It's great to be here, Jody. How you doing? Paul, we're doing great. We're, uh, and I mentioned that we've got a hot guest here today. You're a handsome man, but you're also sitting out in California where you said it's going to be 115 degrees today. Yeah, you know, so that global global warming is apparently a thing. It's going to hit 115 here in uh, Coachella Valley, and and uh, I'm I'm embracing it. I think I was a lizard in my past life, so I just I love the hot weather. <laughs> I love the lack of humidity. It's great. <laughs> That's great. Well, we we do hope you stay cool, and we do hope everybody stays safe uh, because yes. it can get a little bit dangerous when we get into that uh, that area. Um, tell us about your, now you and I are, have similar career trajectories, right? We were, we were reporters back in the big, bad 1990s, mm -hmm. um, and we converted into PR. Tell us about your journey from reporter to PR guy. Yeah. So, um, I was a reporter back in the nineties, like you said. And then, um, one of the things I loved about reporting was sort of getting the early, early scoop on a story. And the deeper I got into journalism, the more I realized, you know, you know where the story is being made. It's actually on the PR side. And I'm, I've always loved telling stories. I've always loved crafting stories. And I decided to go more to the source of the river, so to speak. And that's kind of how I got into PR. It uh, it took me all over the world. I lived, uh, you know, Delaware is where, where my roots are. But I, I did PR work in Singapore for 12 years, uh, worked in-house at Visa there, they brought me back to the U.S. Um, and then I did in-house for Splunk. And that sort of that sort of laid the foundation for starting Upright 12 years ago. What are some of the clients or the types of stories that you've gravitated to over the years? What really, what really gets the motor running? Really great, great data stories. Now, I'll give you a good, two things, data stories and stories that showcase that PR is not just about a pet press release. It can actually make a difference. I'm going to give you a great example of this. In 2004, when I was working in Singapore, uh, there's a big tsunami that hit. Um, and I was working in-house for in PR uh, for Visa. And we sort of, after the tsunami hit, we sort of huddled like, what can we do to make a difference? And Visa had all this great tourism spend data, you know, people from the U.S. coming into Thailand and they're spending X dollars in this week, this week. And we'd never done anything with it externally. So we were like, what if we cobble all this data for the markets that were impacted by the tsunami, give that data to the tourism bodies, to merchants, and then also to the reporters so they can see the trajectory of what a tourism recovery is going to look like for a place that's hit by a natural disaster. 
And that really resonated. And that was sort of I, when I realized, okay, I'm not just, I'm not just writing. I'm not really, we're not just gathering information to promote a company. We can actually make a difference here. That is something that really uh, hits with me because I love telling positive stories, sort of life-changing stories, right? And it doesn't have to be life-changing on a, a particular scale, but just something that means something as opposed to the fire or the car wreck of the day, right? And, and I think yeah. that that's a calling that a lot of PR people um, follow. Um, what, are, what are some of the ways that you have been able to translate and sort of seeing the positive effect of your PR work over the year? I mean, have you run into situations where, you know, you've placed a story or you've run a campaign and something has actually come out of it where you go, wow, we changed something there? Well, I think I think that's the best example. And and I've, I've that's sort of been a, a, a template in my playbook that I've used over the years is, is where where can we tell a story that makes a difference? And one of the things I've always said to clients is, it's not about you. You know, you can you can announce your new office, you can announce your new product, but at the heart of it is what are you doing to make a difference for others or how 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 are you connecting your client, your customers with their audiences. And that's that's where the coverage comes from. And I love I'm a big believer in explaining the process and talking to our clients about what we do and why we do it. You know, I, you know, I, I always say sort of, I, my, my sphincter clenches anytime uh, a client says to me, we want to do a press release about this. And it's like, you've skipped a couple of steps. Let's, um, let's talk about why you want to do this. And remember that press releases are a tactic, not a strategy. And let's step back. Let's look back. What are we trying to do? Who are we trying to reach? What's going to make a difference? And that, that sounds so good to my ears. I talk all the time about how when you're when you're when you're releasing news or you want to get some kind of publicity or attention for something that you've done you got to look outside the four walls of your organization it's got to matter to people outside of what you who what you are what you do every day your employee not about you your, that's that's it exactly it's not about you so grow oh, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that <laughs> um, I, I love this concept that you have, and maybe we can segue into this off of off of that idea about the communications triangle, about how you set about um, creating a message, and then how you make it, you know, sort of ping back and forth among mm -hmm. the three points in that triangle. Give us that triangle. What is that? Yeah, I call I call the triangle of dysfunction. You've got the client, you've got the journalist, and you've got the PR person. So there's the triangle. All three speak different languages and all three need and want different things. And when I started upright, I recognized that 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 lack of commonality in law in language, combined with the fact that very often PR people are the middleman. Um, so, so I was like, how do we smooth those 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 corners of the triangle? And at the heart of it is it's customized content that the reporter is interested in. It's language and data that resonates. And it's also, you know, telling that good story. Um, the other, the other part of that is, and it's it's part of the challenge of sort of breaking, breaking the damage done by the triangle of dysfunction is PR people by nature are people pleasers. It's a blessing and a curse. So, you know, instead of like, hey, PR person, can you do this? Our instinct deep in our soul. It's like, yes, of course we can do it. We'll do it and run off and go figure out how to do it. Whereas where in nine, eight tenths of the time, you need to sort of kick the tires and say, okay, why are we doing this? Let's find a better way. And that's, that's, that's at the heart of the triangle of dysfunction. Uh, that can be challenging to explain to a client uh, and I've put I put it in the sense of, look, we have just as much interest in helping the reporter as we do helping the client. Right. We, we got to be that middleman. I love that that uh, explanation. Um, when you bring that concept to the client, though, they can be like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I've had clients over the years that that bristle at too much counsel. And that's that's always been a challenge for us is, you know, look, you're hiring us to to do something. And, and we know what that is, and you know what that is. The path to get there 
we're not we're not yes people. We're we're not we're not we'll we'll do what you want us to do more often than not. But if it doesn't make sense, we're going to find a better way, or we're going to sh hopefully show you a better way. You know, a good PR person is as much a, a therapist as a doer. Um, one of the things that that when I when I was at Splunk, uh, the challenge I had as a PR person was the people around me didn't speak my language going back to sort of the terminal the, the, the terminology of triangle dysfunction they were all data people they were all software people they were all really smart but had no concept of pr and i couldn't riff with them on and, and this is not to discount them at all i'm just a, I, I couldn't riff with people that didn't understand public relations or communications that's where my agency came in we would we would bounce ideas. I'm like, okay, this person doesn't get what we're doing. How do we how do we get them on board? So you know, they were as much my therapist as they were providing great strategic counsel and helping me do what I needed to do. And yeah, and I've counsel, tried to do that. I've tried to do that at Upright too. The the counsel is the big part. At at its heart, we are counselors, uh, even before we're communicators. Um, yeah helping people make the right decisions and do the right things so that the communications and the publicity and the attention can follow that because it typically always will. It never precedes it, right? No. And it's part, it, 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 it conflicts directly with that pin dancing, people pleasing persona that you have as a PR person. You've got to get that balance right. May I have another, <laughs> please, <laughs> please. <laughs> Can we get that? But you know what? But you know, here's the here's the opposite to that. I find too is that you you don't get what you don't ask for, yeah. right? You don't you 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 all you never get what you don't ask for, uh, and you've got to be out there sort of pounding away and and pounding away with the client too, forcing oh, yeah. them to deliver the thing you know you need in order to tell the story that they want to tell because sometimes they can be very. Uh, whether it's lazy or just not know or whatever, maybe have a pre preconceived notion about, you know, what PR is or how you're supposed to function, you know, here, put this in your news release and send it out, put mm -hmm. this in the paper as it were. Um, yeah. The council aspect the, really. And the other thing about that is some of my, some of my best clients have been the most difficult because they're demanding and it elevates both of our games. You know, they they may make unreasonable demands, but if we can counter with, okay, I see what you're trying to do, let's do this. That, that and hopefully that will achieve that. And the best clients are the ones that respect that and respect the process. You were a business reporter. You and I both know how important. I well, obviously, both of us pitch business reporters now. You know how important data can be, and you told that great story about Visa and, and the uh, the tsunami. Um, how important is data, numbers, objective information like that in story pitches? In invaluable, and and I'll give two examples. You know, one of the things that you know is one of the things PR people and, and companies have have relied on for years is survey data. Survey data is great to a point, but if you've got data that can um, enhance that survey, that's like your own data, your, that no one else can provide, that can provide that third party perspective, that's the stuff reporters are gonna be interested in. Reporters don't necessarily want just survey data. Um, but if you can combine it with your own data or your own story, that creates a picture that creates a, that shows the trend that shows that that you as the you the client are on top of your game you know your business and sometimes the data is the story right it can be something mm -hmm. as simple as a million people did this or we we raised x amount of money or whatever that thing but but very often the data and the graphs that are sort of buried in those annual reports and everything else that sort of flies back and forth in corporate world. You you can pick a nugget out of some of that data and be like, wait oh, a minute, this yeah. is a cool story because here's what it means to the people who are represented by the data, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. And one of, and one of the great things is most companies don't realize the data they have. And one of the things I traditionally try to do, and we traditionally try to do when we start working with a new client, we're like, Who's the data wonk in the company? 
Who's the guy who who has the data that that may be deep in the bowels of the company and no one talks to and doesn't do anything on the PR side? If you can get them on your side and 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 show them what they have, um, you, you've got you've got gold. And uh, you know, and sometimes sometimes the data or the information a company have, they don't realize is a story. You know, one of the things that we do, we do a sort of a client intake form. It's like, okay, what what are some what what are some of the you know the sort of the man bike dog bites dog thing in your company? Do you have do you have a CEO with an interesting hobby? Do you have you know you know does your does your CTO brew beer on weekends, you know, and, and then you sort of, sort of, if, if you could connect that dot, the beer brewing CTO with what the company does, you know, that, that's something that might, that, that a trade publication might be interested in. Jumps right out, right? Almost yeah. tells itself. Speaking really does. of gold, speaking of gold, let's talk about your other job that you have, uh, which is video and video production. We know how important video is. Um, to our work as PR people, as storytellers, as communicators, how do you go about, um, you have an entire unit that produces video. How, what's mm -hmm. your view on video? How do you use it? How do you love to create it? We, well, all yes to emphatic all of the above. We actually started doing video during the pandemic um, when, you know, when everything shut down, we figured out, I think before even Zoom did, we figured out how to harness Zoom as a video tool. Um, and our, our, our mantra was, okay, let's use Zoom to film interviews and get those stories and, and, you know, whether it's a webinar or something. The end result is let's make this Zoom video not look like a Zoom video. So we interspersed graphics and music and different angles. And we realized that video done well can be repurposed so many ways. And I'll give you an example of this. Let's take... Let's say take a panel discussion produced on Zoom. You take a moderator, the CEO of your client, one of their customers, and maybe an analyst. So four people on Zoom, let's interview them. Organic discussion on one topic. No one needs a long approval process. It's just open discussion. Once it's done, we edit it um, and, and take the longest form and put that on their YouTube channel, but then we also repurpose. Let's do a video news release. Let's do a two minute version of this that we can send to reporters to show that the CEO's got their head screwed on right. Let's create 30 second highlight videos that they can put on the YouTube channel. Let's take the transcript and write a byline piece from this. So with that one half hour discussion, we're able to create about 10 pieces of content that can be used, repurposed, and placed out into the world, and that's without without having to jump through approval hoops, without having to um, you know check with legal on 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 data numbers. Um, you know, as long as you don't say anything stupid or or or, or uh, out of line with what you're supposed to say, but it's 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 again it's that narrative. It's talking about. It's not what I call chest thumpy PR. You're talking about an issue that's every, everyone's interested in. You're not talking about the company and how great it is. You're talking about something that people care about. Yeah, far more authentic. And um, borrowing a phrase, I think that Gary Vaynerchuk uses, document and don't create. Yes, right? exactly. It's a, it's a great philosophy. And uh, once I get around to actually being able to do it, I'll be doing it more. <laughs> you, you and me, I have got these great videos that I want to produce for our company. And so they're on the back burner. They're never going to get done. I've got scripts written. I just got to put them all together. And, and but, you know, clients come first. Yep, absolutely. And there's, so, there's only so much I can do with my iPhone here, here in the PR garage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that, where's that's the thing. Where's every, the... every... Every person, every executive has got this great little camera on the top of their laptop. It is high def. It's when it when you're lit and and positioned the right way, it doesn't look like a hostage video. Um, and and you, you can do wonders with it. It's it's the foundation of great content. Yeah, it's the TV studio in your pocket. It really is. And yeah. especially for professional communicators like us 
we have to know how to use that thing. And we can get fancier if we want, but yeah. you've, you've got it in your pocket. It, like you, you said, do. it shoots, it edits, it distributes. You can do everything with that phone. So get used to using it um, exactly. if, if you aren't already. Um, how are, what creative ways are you using video um, to tell stories on social? What are, what are some of the trends that you're seeing on social? Aside from the platforms that seem to change every day, um, are there are there new and interesting ways that you're using video to tell stories? I think the biggest thing is like taking that long form content and just creating nuggets, but also being quick and and on the fly. Don't don't underestimate you know taking your phone out and taking like a 15 second shot of something at a conference you're seeing and putting it on social. Um, like I said, these these things are gold in terms of video quality it's 1080p high def you can you can interview a customer you can hey this is a great interesting booth i saw at uh, the conference over the weekend put it out there and just just engage and if you have some video content that's visually interesting people are going to click on that that post the tweet that um instagram post tiktok whatever they're going to look at it in a way that just text doesn't because text and still still photos don't necessarily do. Yeah, no no doubt. It, it is the supreme call to action as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Grabbing someone with video and having and rolling them right into doing something that you want them to do. Uh, it, it's fantastic. Um, you and I could talk forever as two ex-reporters. We could talk for a very long time, but we got to move on through to the end of our podcast here sure. uh, and talk about and segue actually into the rapid fire question portion of the show. This is where we steal a page from inside the actor studio. We ask our guests a series of rapid fire questions meant to elicit a simple answer, maybe a laugh or two with your indulgence, Paul Wilkie from Coachella Valley, California. Uh, let's find out rapid fire question. Number one, what's your favorite news source? I like Google News. It kind of has everything there. It's got a little enough AI in there that it sort of customizes the content. But it gives me it gives me a good summary before I dive deep into the trade publications. Yep, got to do it. Rapid fire question number two: What's your favorite social media platform? I hate to say it, but I still like Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Me too. I'm there. Uh, rapid fire question number three: Coffee or alcohol? Both. Ah, that's an that's an effective answer. I love it. <laughs> Rapid fire question number four: What's your favorite on the run food? I am a pizza guy. I will. I I could eat pizza three meals a day. I don't, but I could. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both, man. And rapid fire question number five: What do you want to be after you finish this career? I want to be a kept man. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. I can be down. I've 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 joked with my wife often. You know, I I work here at home in the PR garage, but I joke with my wife often. I'm like, I could be I could be stay at home like kept man like. Oh yeah. I just manage the house. I'll do the laundry. Make sure the that's, food's good. I'm good. That's a dream job. <laughs> no sugar mama. You know. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. She, she's got a job, right? She can go out and take care of this. <laughs> well, Paul, this has been a fun conversation. Please let people know how they can find you online. You can see us at walkingduck.com walking or uprightcoms.com uh, on, on X slash Twitter. Same thing, Upright uh, and Walking Duck. We're on Instagram. We're on all the social media places. You can also find my personal stuff. It's usually... P. Wilkie, P. W. I. L. K. E. Um, let me know you saw this, and we'll uh, we'll definitely engage. I love I love connecting with people on social media. Sounds good, Paul. We will definitely be running into you out there. Thank you for uh, being on the show today, and thank you everyone for listening. Please remember to subscribe to the show. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at the PR Podcast, and send us a question or a comment. Our intro is by Christopher Appolt. You can find him and his fantastic photography on Instagram at Christopher underscore A-P-P-O-L-D-T. Check him out there and hire him for all your photography needs. You can find me online at Jody Fisher on all the socials and on the web at JodyFisherPR.com. We'll see you next time on the PR Podcast. <laughs>